Welcome to The Cap, where we are here to speak with college reps and other professionals in the field of college admissions to help answer all your questions and guide you through every step of the process. So if you're serious about college admissions, you've come to the right place. Are you ready? Let's talk about it. And now, here's your host, Dr. John Durante. Welcome to The Cap, the College Admissions Process Podcast. I am your host, John Durante, and I am here to introduce you to college admissions representatives and other professionals in the field of college admissions. Our purpose is to serve you, the students and parents, so that you may gain insight straight from the people who ultimately make the decisions. Regardless of whether you apply to a particular school being highlighted in a given episode, you should listen to all of them, as each guest will give you tremendous insight and advice on every aspect of the college admissions process, prompting you to come up with your own follow-up questions for when you visit campus or meet with a college admissions representative yourself. Don't forget to visit our website, www.collegeadmissionstalk.com, or the show notes of each episode to access the alphabetical list of all the colleges available with the related audio link to the right of each school. The alphabetical list provides you with on-demand access to all of the episodes so that you may listen whenever you wish. And if you want to receive links to episodes before they are released on the podcast, along with other related resources, please fill out the email opt-in form also available on our website and in the show notes of each episode. Lastly, please email me with any questions or comments at collegeadmissionstalk at gmail.com. So are you ready? Let's talk about it. Welcome to The Cap, the College Admissions Process Podcast. I am your host, John Durante, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce you today, Chandra DeCoven, who's the Director of Admissions at Wesleyan University in beautiful Middletown, Connecticut. Chandra, thank you so much for being here today. How are you? I'm doing well, John. Thank you so much for having uh, Wesley in today and for hosting me. Uh, but I also do want to thank you for providing the service for students and families that are going through this process. It's a wonderful service. It is my honor and pleasure. I just went through it with not one but two daughters, and uh, that's why we're here. We're here to help students and their parents. So, Chandra, thank you again for being here. I can't wait to hear all about Wesleyan. So let's get right to it. What is it about Wesleyan University that makes it so appealing for so many students to want to apply and ultimately attend? So I have to say we are very privileged to have incredibly loyal and passionate alums that covertly but also overtly introduce Wesleyan to those who may not be familiar with Wesleyan University. So when they start to learn about Wesleyan, whether it's through a social contact or perhaps uh, introduced to it um, via the film industry, we're well represented there. Uh, When students learn about Wesleyan and they research uh, who we are, many become incredibly excited about our progressive approach to a liberal arts and sciences education, specifically discovering the ability to pursue their passions and interests at a high level while having agency over their educational experience through the open curriculum. So let me explain a little bit about the open curriculum because that is unique. Um, So Wesleyan is one of 25 institutions. There might be more, so please don't fact check me on this, about approximately 25 (laughs) institutions that do not saddle uh, students with graduation requirements up front. Uh, In fact, To graduate from Wesleyan, you must take 32 courses or 32 credits and fulfill at least one major. So requirements are influenced by your declared major, and typically students will declare a major at the end of their sophomore year. So to major in one particular area, it's usually 10 to 12 credits or courses out of those 32. So this approach offers a great deal of flexibility to pursue desperate areas of interest, and more than half of our students will double major, not because they have to and they feel compelled to, but rather because of the flexibility that the open curriculum affords. Some other benefits of the open curriculum, it empowers students to explore the breadth of our course offerings, introducing students to subject areas and topics that they had not previously explored. Uh, With the assistance of a highly structured advising system, students direct their educational path. Advisors can push students and encourage them to try a class uh, without risk. And I I do want to point out that at Wesleyan, our um, professors, our advisors actually teach one less course than their peers do, so that it allows for ample time for advising. So advising is a critical component of your Wesleyan experience. There's also a heightened level of engagement 
when you have a classroom full of students that genuinely are interested in the subject area, they want to be there. Um, there's a great deal of diversity of thought, experience, and insight when you have students from a variety of different academic backgrounds. And this allows you to look at a scenario or a problem or a question from a variety of different angles. And then I will also share with you what draws Wesleyan um, or prospective students to Wesleyan is our community. Uh, we are a smaller residential campus of 3,000 students, and prospective students can find like-minded individuals as well as peers that are very different from themselves here at West. Uh, students will also find scholar teachers that are excited to share their knowledge and contribute to your academic growth and academic and personal growth. Um, they choose West because the faculty members choose West, uh, because they want to engage with the students. And so it's not unheard of for a Nobel laureate or a MacArthur Genius Award winner to engage with our students and teach our undergraduate students. Um, and our students deeply benefit from this relationship. So it's also a warm, accepting community where students get to be their authentic selves. And this unique community also includes our impressive and passionate alumni network who support the student experience through philanthropy, internships, and also engagement. And I love meeting with our alums because they are some of our biggest cheerleaders, um, greatest advocates, um, but also advocates for changing West and um, pushing us to grow as an institution and to really think about the future ahead. Well, I really appreciate that overview, and I love that you give students time to explore, particularly in their first and second year. In fact, you talked about how most students don't declare a major until the end of sophomore year. Some even end up double majoring because during those exploratory times, they realize that they love more than just one thing, so they're offered the opportunity to double major. And perhaps even more important, I love how you explain the sense of community at Wesleyan University. I read a statistic that is truly amazing. Your retention rate was 97%. So 97% of your students returned, which is a testament to the great work you do in admissions in terms of making sure that the right students come on campus, but also that feeling, that community sense that you foster uh, once they are in fact on campus. So again, Chandra, thank you so much for that introduction and, and that overview. I really appreciate it. And of course, if a student is going to come to Wesleyan, hopefully they're going to have the opportunity to visit before they actually matriculate. So when a student visits, what are some of the areas that are an absolute must in terms of where they should visit? And what types of questions should they be asking to in fact determine whether or not Wesleyan is the right fit for them? That's such a great question. And, and I will share, first of all, um, we offer a variety of virtual options uh, online. So for the families or students that aren't able to come and visit us either before the application process or afterward, please know that you can get a pretty good sense of Wesleyan uh, through those online virtual opportunities. But if you find yourself in Middletown, um, aptly named because we're two hours from New York City and two hours from Boston, and um, we are a small city of about 60,000, uh, very easy access if you do find yourself on campus. I um, certainly encourage you to sign up for an information session and also a tour and it's a student-led tour so you're going to get that student perspective and also hear about um, what the student uh, how the student is engaged um, both in the classroom and beyond and also um, within Middletown how do our students utilize the beautiful city that um, we reside in and so prospective students can receive a pretty good authentic experience um, by virtue of uh, taking advantage of a tour and also an information session. The information session typically is co-hosted by an admission dean and also a student ambassador, or we call them student interviewers, but they do more than just interview. Uh, they're really great ambassadors for the institution. They're senior leaders on campus, and they're just a great wealth of information. I would also recommend to, um, our campus is about 300 acres, so it's not a huge campus, it's relatively flat, um, so it's very easy to ambulate around, but I encourage you to get out to Long Lane Farm, which is our organic farm, very close to our Freeman Center, which is our athletic center. Um, Wesleyan's unique, and we have um, some of our athletic facilities in the middle of campus, including our baseball, football field, and also soccer field, so you can literally roll out of studying at the library and then go on to um, support one of your peers and their game and their um, 
extracurricular activity. So um, encourage students to look around, split up from their families, and ask questions. USDAN is our student center with dining and all, it's the hub of activity. Uh, it's also a great place to get a sense of the vibe on campus. And, Visiting campus is a little bit of an anthropological study uh, of you can read a lot of the information about what we have to offer and our nuances, but you can really get a sense of the feel um, of an institution and whether it, it feels right to you, whether you found your people by, by visiting. <laughs> um, and so um, to a certain degree, you can get a sense of that uh, through virtual, uh, the virtual visit experience and also engaging in conversations with our um, student ambassadors. But um, by visiting campus, that's a great opportunity. So again, encourage you to visit uh, during the week if you can. I know that's hard to do sometimes, but if you visit during the week, you'll also have an opportunity to sit in our classes and really understand the open curriculum um, and how that manifests itself um, in the classroom setting. Well, we appreciate that. And thank you for explaining about the many virtual and in-person opportunities to actually visit campus. And I love how you explained how Middletown is two hours from New York City, two hours from Boston, which provides, I'm sure, a wealth of opportunities for students to explore on weekends or even internship opportunities. So thank you for that. I was also curious, Chandra, how many applications does the admissions team at Wesleyan review a year? And do you personally represent a specific region? Any insight that you could give in terms of your overall process would be greatly appreciated. Great. Well, I'd like to say as the director of admission, I'm uh, representing uh, a lot of different regions <laughs> and different perspectives. And it, it is a great privilege to have that opportunity to read so many um, applicants, but amazing students that um, make their way to our applicant pool. So each year we receive approximately, we're now um, uh, have surpassed 15,000 applications. Wow. Um, and so through the, the months of November uh, through mid-March, so March Madness has a different <laughs> Uh, meaning for us in the admission side of things, but um, we are spent we, that time is spent reviewing and assessing files, and so we do have regional deans that are kind of the territory expert, and so they know the nuances of particular areas. They um, are very familiar with the schools. Um, however, if students have questions, they can really talk to any one of the deans, and we should be able to answer that question. You don't necessarily have to talk to that regional dean in order to get the answer or make sure information gets added to your file. So every um, file is read and reviewed by multiple sets of eyes uh, before a decision is made, and we use all portions of the application to piece together a greater understanding of the student, their story, and potential to contribute. And so we practice holistic admissions, so that allows us to take multiple pieces of information and understand how what that means within the context of the world of COVID, the context of the world that we're living in today, or your community, your school, the resources that are or may not be available to you. Um, we oftentimes get questions about, may I send extra letters of recommendation? May I send um, my script to you? May I send um, my awards from kindergarten on to um, senior year of high school? And while we would love to have the opportunity to read everything that you want to send us as part of your file, unfortunately, the volume and the, the compression of time that we have, we just can't do that. So we want to make sure that we're spending the most amount of time on the core components of your application. So please make sure you're sending in all the required information. <laughs> and if you're interested in sending in extra material, there are oftentimes ways of doing that or ways of highlighting certain talents, whether um, I, I would first start with having a conversation with your college counselor. They may have a great um, suggestion as to, hey, that's something I can just really add into my letter recommendation, or this is a, a great follow-up email that um, you can follow up with with a page so it's a little bit more digestible than, say, uh, 10 pages of a manuscript or an art portfolio. Uh, we do have a means of sending in supplemental materials through um, uh, the, the website as well as Common App and also SCORE. So um, more information is available there. But that is really optional. And I do, when we say optional, we really do mean optional. <laughs> well, that's great. Thank you so much for that overview. We really appreciate it. And I was curious, what is the average profile of the current freshman class? 
Each year we publish the profile of last year's admitted class. So uh, very soon, if it's not up there already, we will have a profile of the class of um, 20. 26. Oh my goodness, the class of 2026. <laughs> um, I can't believe I'm saying that. Um, and so that's going to give you a lot of data. But what I want to share with you is that the data doesn't tell you about the students themselves, about the individuals themselves. And I'm always very curious of how students and families digest that data, because I think you can tell yourself a different story depending upon how you look at things or your, your questions and your concerns and so forth. So I, I do want to share what's important to us is that um, we're inviting a group of students that are deeply curious, that are academic risk takers who want to delve deeper into a particular area of interest. They want to use their knowledge to improve the human condition and solve problems of today. And they're a bit impatient, so that's not featured in our profile. <laughs> and they do that in various ways and it, express that in various ways. And we recognize this and we want to support their ideas and their and intrepidness. Uh, and we have programs and grants that will provide financial and human resources to support an initiative and our idea. Um, but again, what the profile doesn't highlight is how the student engages with their teachers and peers in the academic setting and also within their community, um, for which we are deeply interested in because we are inviting students to our residential community. And we do get this critical information through our letters of recommendation, um, and we pay close attention to the letters of recommendation when reviewing your application. Well, we appreciate that. And Chandra, of course, part of the application is the student's transcript. What are the first things you notice as part of your evaluation process when you're looking at the transcript? Sure. Um, so first and foremost, uh, and I recognize I, you had asked me this question and I conveniently ignored to answer it. So I do have a territory that I oversee. Uh, <laughs> is, it is New York City as well as um, South Asia. Um, wow. And so I'm very familiar with the school systems um, and the different schools there. But every year, um, and particularly in COVID, I've found myself revisiting the school profile um, that we receive from every school. And I'm not sure if, if students are aware of this. I think they're introduced to the school profile when they apply. And otherwise, you wouldn't know that there's a school profile and all this great, rich information that we get from school schools and understanding what's available to students, how they've taken advantage of the curriculum, any um, restrictions, whether it is particular courses. But during COVID, we received a lot of helpful information and insight with regards to how schools reacted to COVID and how they furthered education despite um, some of the... Well, some, many of the challenges <laughs> that we face during COVID. So that was particularly helpful of understanding, again, that, that context. So I, I want to understand the context. And then when I look at the grades, um, I am glancing at the grades. And, but I want to point out that grades or transcripts are measurement. It's not performance. It's a measurement. And so we're interested in understanding what those grades mean. Specifically, um, the performance, did you engage with the curriculum, the class, or was the material so easy you just soaked up the information and regurgitated it out when it was, came time for the exam? How did you handle ambiguity? Um, can you ask for help? Can you quietly lend help to others and identify that? The open curriculum requires students to wrestle with ideas, be challenged with new concepts, ask the questions, and be comfortable in the uncomfortable. Our students are very comfortable being uncomfortable at Wesleyan, so um, if you're a, a type of student like that, definitely check us out. Um, but we also um, enjoy learning about a student's strengths and how they've overcome challenges. And so that's what I get from the transcript plus the letters of recommendation. So getting back to the transcript, I'm also looking at rigor and the strength of the program. So number of core academic courses that students have taken, the trajectory from first year of high school to present. Yes, we do consider your first year. Yes, we do give you leeway in understanding you're adjusting to a new system um, and do recognize that. Um, but we uh, do find this information particularly important. Um, and, but we're looking that, at that trajectory to get a sense of how a student acclimated um, to a new educational experience and, and system, because that's very telling of how they may acclimate to our college campus. Well, thank you so much, Chandra, for that tremendous overview. We really appreciate it. 
What about demonstrated interest? What are some of the things that students do to demonstrate their interest in Wesleyan? And is that something that you track as part of your overall application process? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, we touched upon it a little bit earlier on in the process of the regional dean. And first of all, Wesleyan does not uh, take into account demonstrated interest when reviewing your application and making a decision. We recognize there's challenges of access. Uh, we also recognize that students will find us at different times. And so um, we don't want to um, have our opinion bias based upon when you may have landed on our radar screen. Um, and, and so that's important to us. But we also recognize for many students and families, uh, they feel the need, I need to speak to the regional coordinator or the regional dean that oversees the application because they're going to have an impact. Um, and it's important to show my demonstrated interest. Um, I would say for a place like Wesleyan, it's more impactful for us to understand your demonstrated understanding of a liberal arts institution and the value and the impact, but also the open curriculum. And so that's telling for us. And so you don't necessarily have to sit in on an info session, uh, take advantage of a tour. You can do that research on your own and show that demonstrated knowledge and understanding through your application. So you can do that from the comfort of your home uh, without going anywhere. Um, but please know that um, what we're looking at and what we're assessing in our application is your academic and personal, the potential for contribution at our institution. Well, I appreciate that. So it's the academic potential, but I love how you talk about not demonstrated interest, but demonstrated understanding. So whether it's in a supplemental or the essay itself, if a student could really convey that they truly understand the philosophy and what you're looking for in a school like Wesleyan, uh, it, it, it could only help their overall application. So I appreciate that insight. Thank you so much. I was also curious, Chandra, what's Wesleyan's philosophy in terms of how you approach the wait list? So each year we do factor utilizing the wait list as part of our enrollment model and part of shaping our class. And our model is highly dependent upon the behaviors of teenagers. So as you can imagine, sometimes we're spot on and sometimes we over enroll, which can have financial implications and also uh, potentially compromise the academic experience if we're heavily over-enrolled. But if we are under-enrolled, we can then use the wait list, again, to shape the rest of the class. So we always get the question, how do I improve my likelihood of, of getting off the wait list? So I want to let you know that, first of all, we do not utilize the wait list as a soft deny. It's not our way of saying, um, we, we just can't deny you, so we're just going to wait list everyone. We're very thoughtful about that. And in fact, our wait list is particularly strong, and we feel that these students can easily contribute in very meaningful ways and exciting ways. We just didn't have room to make that initial offer of admission. So there's no need to send additional letters of recommendation. Again, you're strong. We just didn't have room for you. Um, what you can do is, first of all, if you're still interested in the wait list, respond saying, yes, I'd like to remain on your wait list. So about half of our students will say, yes, I'd like to um, <laughs> take advantage of your offer of remaining on the wait list. And then towards the end of April, um, early May, you can certainly send us an email, just a quick email, indicating your continued interest. Um, and sometimes the squeaky wheel gets the oil. Uh, I, I don't think it hurts to send a quick note. But what we don't want you to do is spend a lot of time um, asking for additional letters of recommendation, to come and visit campus, to contact us, and try to make a case for yourself. Because if we do go to the wait list, oftentimes who we invite off the wait list has nothing to do, well, you don't have necessarily control over it. We're looking at our incoming class, and we're looking to enhance our incoming class. So we're thinking about who's missing from the table and how, how can we shape the incoming class through our wait list. So um, we encourage you again to focus on um, giving us an update, but you really should be focusing on researching uh, and visiting the other schools that may have offered you admission and, and thinking about um, where you might be depositing come May 1st. 
Well, that's great advice. Thank you so much. And Chandra, what about interviews, whether they are evaluative or informational? Do you offer them? And if so, what advice would you give a student preparing for their interview? So we do offer evaluative interviews that are optional. And again, we do uh, stress that it, it, we really mean optional. They are um, up to a student to decide whether or not this might be a good platform for you to share more information about yourself, um, maybe more information about things you're interested in, um, certain clubs and activities, maybe some pieces of information that's not easily addressed on your application. That might be a great uh, platform to, to interview. Um, our interviews are conducted by our senior ambassador or we call them senior interviewers, um, and also our network of trained alums uh, that have graciously taken time out of their schedule to meet with students and um, really connect, uh, but also answer your questions. So this is also a great opportunity for you to learn more about the institution from the perspective of a current student um, or from an alum. And asking questions such as, when you were considering Wesleyan, uh, what were some of the thoughts or concerns that went through your head? Um, and our, our students and our alums are great about sharing their own experiences, but recognizing that was maybe their own experience and maybe a little different from, say, their peers. But this can be helpful information um, as well. And sometimes it's information that you pack away and you remember when you're receiving all those wonderful decision letters. And then it's the tough part, that making that decision of where do I go? Well, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. And what are the different ways a student may apply to Wesleyan? And is there a benefit to applying one way over the other? So we have a variety of different plans uh, for application. And so we subscribe to early decision, which is a commitment um, that students make. So it is binding. And so we offer early decision one and early decision two. And we each year, it will vary in terms of number of applicants, but typically we'll see about a thousand applications through our early decision um, program. And so early decision is really stating that Wesleyan is your number one choice. If admitted, I will enroll, uh, contingent upon uh, your financial aid package being realistic and reasonable for you and your family um, so that Wesleyan can be an affordable option for you come, uh, come fall. But otherwise, we're going to be looking at you within a smaller context. It's a smaller pool of applicants. You're making that commitment to us. Um, so you're telling us we're your number one choice. And you're also eloping because it's a, a quick process. So um, you need to think about this step and really decide whether or not a place like Wesleyan is your top choice. Now, if there's any doubt in your mind, please don't apply early. We want to make sure that you're excited about the decision when you receive it, and you're equally excited when you hear your friends and, and observe your peers receiving wonderful letters of admission later that spring. We certainly want that enthusiasm along the way. Now, statistically, there is an advantage to applying early decision. And I, I will share with you that the pool is particularly strong. It is smaller. And so our acceptance rates tend to be higher with early decision. I will also point out that our pool of applicants are quite diverse, both geographically, economically, uh, culturally, racially, in, in, in terms of interest uh, activities, as well as um, academics. So we're really, re very pleased with the pool that we see in early decision, but we wanna make sure there's plenty of room in regular decision to, again, shape our class. And our deadline for regular decision is January 1st. So um, again, early decision one uh, is November 15th. Uh, early decision two is January 1st. So it gives you a little bit more time. Now, we like to see your senior grades uh, during early, and so that's important to us. So if your school doesn't send them, it's very likely we'll be calling up your, uh, your school office and asking for that information because that is, <laughs> that's very helpful information uh, for us as we're um, reviewing your academics and also um, your personal credentials. Each year, we receive about 500 applications uh, to consider um, students coming from two and also four-year institutions to enroll at Wesleyan. And typically, students will have uh, enrolled at another institution, again, either a two-year or four-year institution, for at least a year before they apply. Um, and so we're able to welcome a group of students through the transfer 
option and we typically bring in an incoming class of anywhere from 40 to 50 transfer students each fall. So it's a nice group of, of students and uh, a nice cohort uh, that we're bringing to campus uh, along with our incoming first year class. Well, we appreciate that. Thank you so much, Chandra, for the overview. And I know that Wesleyan, like many other schools, is in fact test optional. Can you share the percentage of students that applied and that were ultimately admitted that did not submit their test scores? Mm -hmm. So back in 2014, Wesleyan joined nearly 1,000 other institutions that had gone test optional. So I, I do want to stress that this whole test optional, this is well before COVID. Um, and so we had a great deal of experience in uh, file review and um, recognizing what tests can and cannot tell us. And so we wanted to make sure that students had that choice. Students had the choice of determining whether or not they felt uh, that a, a test on a very early Saturday morning or for, for Connecticut residents, uh, possibly during the school day, um, <laughs> whether that it was a good, an accurate depiction of their true academic ability or whether their day-to-day -day work stood for itself. And so um, we also recognize that was a choice before COVID. During COVID, there were lots of students that didn't have a choice. They just simply could not take the exam or try to take the exam and it was canceled numerous times. So when we indicate optional, we truly mean that. And so before the pandemic, um, about 30% of our students that were admitted elected not to send their scores in. Um, and then during the pandemic, that jumped to 50% of our admitted students elected not to send their scores. Now, each year for those who were able to take the test, for those who didn't submit, we do ask for their scores for research purposes because we're interested in, in looking at that. And so each year, we have students that elect not to send in their scores and have them factored into the admission process and they're excellent scores. So I think that really <laughs> speaks to um, just the, the comfort level of the student and recognizing that they're more than just a score. And uh, again, their interests, their curiosity, their day-to-day -day work in and outside the classroom really speaks for itself. Well, again, we appreciate that overview. And I was also curious, does Wesleyan accept AP, IB, or dual enrollment classes for credit? So Wesleyan does allow two credits or two classes of um, advanced coursework. Uh, that is typically dependent or determined by the department. And so over the summertime, students can submit uh, their AP scores or their IB scores for that consideration. We also have testing for diagnostic uh, as it relates to uh, secondary languages as well as math to get a better sense of where students are coming in and making sure we're placing them correctly in the appropriate level um, so that they're successful. Unfortunately, we do not uh, give credit for dual enrollment classes and we recognize there's um, quite a few early college programs out there. Um, the Bard High School Early College to, uh, as an example of that. Um, and for students that are applying, uh, coming from those institutions, they will apply as a first year student and um, they won't necessarily get credit, uh, advanced credit for those courses. But with the 32 credits to graduate, that's four credits or four courses each semester. So uh, there's usually not a problem with our students graduating on time. Um, many of our students actually um, have a great deal of flexibility to either graduate early um, or take on uh, some extra classes along the way that they didn't get a chance to take. Well, we appreciate that. And I know that you touched upon it a little bit earlier, but I want to ask, how important are students' courses in progress and their grades in senior year and what are you looking for when reviewing them? So senior year performance, and notice I said performance and not grades, it's very important. Um, <laughs> these, so these are the courses that are likely the most advanced courses that you've taken thus far. And you're no longer relying upon rote learning, but rather comprehension, analytical and critical thinking, class engagement and discourse. So these are the very skills that you will use in college. So senior year is not just a conduit for college. It's not just a stepping stone to college. And I also want to point out, it is important. This is where I'm going to say grades. Your final grades do matter. Um, so uh, we hear about students and, you know, 
I've worked really hard. I've gotten admitted to some great institutions. I'm just going to let my foot off the gas. We call that the senior slide. Please, <laughs> the best way to honor, honor your teachers and educators and thank them is to finish strong. And that's going to best prepare you for your next educational environment and, be, and position you well to be successful in college. Um, so, uh, you know, I was a former college counselor, so we received some of those letters. We were copied in on those letters of, you know, we noticed that your transcript does not reflect, it does not reflect the same transcript for which um, we saw when we offered you admission. We need to have a conversation. So uh, please do not let your foot off the gas. It's important to finish strong. So the last sprint of, or the last mile of the marathon, it may not be a sprint, but you're going to you're going to uh, have a strong finish. Well, I love the reference to the senior slide as opposed to the typical senioritis. So thank you so much for the new term, Chandra. And of course, another piece of the overall application is the college essay. Chandra, what are some examples of essays that really stuck with you? And what advice would you provide prospective students in terms of what to think about when they're sitting down to begin writing their essays? Mm -hmm. I think this is the hardest part of the application. It's my favorite part of the application, I have to say. Um, but I, I, I do want to stress, it is one piece of the puzzle on its own. It's not going to secure admission. So no one has been admitted solely based upon their, their, um, their personal essay. Um, most essays are just fine and will provide us with the necessary information we need and we're looking for. So we're trying to get a sense of your ability to write, your thought process, what matters to you, and get a sense of your personality. So in lieu of examples, I, I will share with you the commonality that um, resonates with me. First of all, the authentic voice and from the heart. And again, this is a personal essay. And that's hard because you're putting yourself out there. It's not an academic essay. It's not poetry. It's not a biography of your mentor. Rather, it's a personal essay. And again, we recognize that it is very hard because you're putting yourself out there. And it's truly an honor and a privilege to get to know you through your, your essay and have that glimpse into your life. So as we know, good writing takes time. And like your papers in school, there will be numerous edits and additions. And we're assembling a community of dynamic scholars. And as we read your writing, we're asking ourselves, is this person, would this person make a good lab partner, a roommate, a leader of an organization? Are they likable? Okay, sounds fair. So again, strength of your writing, the ability to put your thoughts into words and onto paper, but also get a sense of your personality. There are some topics that you may want to avoid uh, with a personal essay. Keep in mind, it is a page and a half. And some topics are particularly difficult to tackle in that page and a half. And I would encourage you, uh, before you submit your essay, making sure that uh, either your college counselor or perhaps um, someone well-versed in the rules of grammar is reviewing your essay and also providing some feedback of, of whether or not um, they feel that this is a, an accurate depiction of your voice. Um, one of my colleagues likes to uh, use the term 3D as the topics to avoid, and that includes divorce, death, and depression. Um, I have seen essays that have incorporated those themes or one of those themes, and a student has been able to effectively write about that. But I think those areas are hard, and so perhaps may want to stay away from the, the 3Ds. Um, and so... I also recognize as you're getting feedback regarding your essay and um, whether it is grammar or mechanics and so forth, there are a lot of well-intended adults out there that want to be helpful. Um, and they may want to assist you with your essay. And what's important to us is to hear the voice of a 17, 18-year-old and not the voice of your uncle who is a writer for the New York Times but rather, we want to hear your voice, and that's important to us. Um, and I just want to remind students, we were 17 and 18 years old once, and our personal essay was likely not the strongest example of our writing portfolio. <laughs> so we get it. We understand. Um, we did talk about in our office about finding our, our college essays and, and 
putting them up online just as a, a way to kind of uh, reassure <laughs> students that um, we, we get it, we understand, and, um, you know, here's what we submitted when we were going through the process. Um, so that's uh, some tips with regards to the, the personal essay. Well, those are great tips and great advice. I know it's going to be very helpful to a lot of students and their parents, as is this entire conversation. And Chandra, it leads us to our last question, which is, what are your top three pieces of advice for the students and their parents getting ready for the college admissions process? Oh, so as adults, we have lots of difficult, uncomfortable conversations with youth, with young adults, right? And that's part of our role. And I would say for students and parents, if you haven't had the conversation about finances, it's better to do that now versus having surprises down the road. And also it may shift, that conversation may shift the types of schools, uh, where they're located, um, the cost of those institutions as a result of that conversation. So students, if you're listening, you can start tonight. You can, if you're writing with a parent and it's dark, this is perfect because you can you don't even look at one another and you can engage in this conversation and just perhaps start with saying, hey, I listened to this podcast. Some woman from Wesleyan suggested that we have a conversation about financial support as it relates to uh, colleges and universities. And just kind of curious as I engage in this process and as I'm looking at some wonderful schools, but some near, some far, some uh, very reasonably priced and, uh, and some incredibly expensive, what type of financial support are you prepared or may not be prepared um, to, to, to support me through this process? And also, what are your expectations? Um, should I choose one institution over another? And that be, could be a conversation of um, financial aid uh, and applying for financial aid. And the financial aid package will be a key component and consideration as um, you make a final decision. Or we have the ability to pay this much. However, summers and other events that you are accustomed to um, may have to be put on hold because we're investing a great deal uh, of money into this endeavor called uh, college. And so that um, sets up a, a conversation of understanding not only um, where things stand, but also um, understanding values. Um, and, and that can come up later on as well. So again, have that difficult conversation about Finances. We also, all of our institutions have a net price calculator so you can get a better sense of um, whether or not you qualify for financial aid and also, um, if so, how much. Now, the information is only as good as the information that you put in. So please, if you can try to be as accurate as possible, um, that will be most helpful in getting uh, that, that answer for you. So in this process, adults, have a role in this process. In many cases, it's signing forms, it's playing Uber driver, it is playing executive assistant um, to the student, but it's very important that this process is driven by the student. And so students can be their own chief information officer, and I would encourage students to communicate and over communicate. And this is important for a variety of reasons because when you're forthcoming with this communication, it reassures the adults in your life that you got this. Adults, I encourage you to allow the students to ask for help rather than swooping in and making it happen. It's easy to do, I recognize. And um, sometimes when schedules get busy, it's the go to. But I encourage that parents and adults really lend, allow students to, to, to manage this process. Colleges and universities, we recognize we are partnering with, with families, with parents. Um, however, we're going to approach this um, as the student being an adult. We are inviting the student to our community and enrolling in our community. Um, and that's very important for you to understand because that access to information will change um, as a student enrolls in our institution. By um, being forthcoming, by communicating well and um, following through, students, you are um, developing key skills for later on in terms of self-advocacy, communication, and that, again, is reassuring for the adults in your life to know that you are, um, you're not only academically, but you're personally ready for that next step. 
And so I, I think that was technically two, but I'll, I'll stop there because I, I don't want to sound naggy. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you don't sound naggy at all. And this has been a phenomenal conversation. I really appreciate your time, your insight, your advice. I'm so happy because I know that this is going to help so many students and their parents navigate the college admissions process. Chandra, I hope to have you again. Thank you so much. Thank you, John. Thank you for joining us on this episode of The Cap, the College Admissions Process Podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, please don't forget to tell a friend and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and wherever you listen to your podcasts. I am your host, John Durante, and I look forward to seeing you on the next episode of The Cap.